it's the first working day this week i hope you enjoyed your holiday it's now time to have that relevant and current business conversation that you've been waiting for and it's going to happen here on business morning live on channels television you're welcome i'm ini john mekwa but we'll start with what's happening in nigeria vehicles clearing agents have threatened to close their stores this week following the introduction of 15 percent national automobile commission levy imposed on imported used vehicles by the Nigeria Customs Service. The NCS had recently introduced a 15% National Automobile Commission levy on used imported vehicles, a move which they say is in compliance with the Economic Community of West Africa Common External Tariff. However, car dealers argue that the NAC levy is mostly meant for new vehicles, questioning the rationale behind the introduction of the duty on used vehicles. Go to the global space prices of oil rose today as investors fretted over tight global supply after Libya was forced to hold some exports and as factories in Shanghai prepare to reopen post the COVID-19 shutdown easing some demand worries. Brent crude features rose 16 cents to $113.77 a barrel while U.S. West Texas intermediate crude features gained 33 cents to $108.54 a barrel. Outages in Libya deep in concern over tight global supply and Ukraine crisis dragged on, offsetting concern over slowing Chinese demand. The latest supply hit came just as fuel demand in China. The world's largest oil importer was expected to pick up as manufacturing plants prepare to reopen in Shanghai. Although oil prices are still vulnerable to demand shocks as China continues to impose soft curbs to contain COVID-19 outbreaks and Libya outage highlights just how bullishly reactive oil markets have become to supply shops. Well, just before Easter last week, we had that inflation figure. And of course, it does show that there's a surge in Nigeria's inflation, the CPI for the month of March. We'll talk about that and a whole lot more after the break. Do stay with us. This is Business Morning on Channel Television. Welcome back. Well, Nigeria's inflation rate rose in February after recording a fall in January. Consumer price index increased between February 2021 and February 2022 was 15.70% higher, uh, 15, 15, higher than 15.6% that was recorded in January. And then it went from 15.70 to 15.92% for the month of March. Well, there's some of the drivers, although they are kind of obvious. Uh, looking at the month of March and the activities there. But let's uh, drive deep into that with Adishala Sumoni, analyst with Financial Derivatives Company, joining us from Reading in the United Kingdom. Hi, Adishala. Good morning. Welcome back from the holiday. Been a while. Good morning, Nini. Thank you. It's been a while. Yes, thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, good to have you. Well, the surge in inflation, I, I think, doesn't come as a surprise. This is uh, predicted uh, with the war in Ukraine, uh, the sanctions on Russia, the volatility in the oil prices, and a lot of happenings in Nigeria. I mean, this was expected, I believe. Yes, it was indeed. Like you mentioned, Ine, um, Nigeria's headline inflation has increased in March to five-month high of 15.92%. Um, um, up from 15.70% um, um, in February. On a month-on-month -month basis, it also increased 1.7% um, month-on-month, uh, from, up from, um, up from um, 1.6% in February. And some of the drivers, as you mentioned, is the price of diesel, for example. The price of diesel um, um, averaged around um, 288 naira today per liter um, in January, but that increased sharply to about 700, 750 um, naira per liter in March, which is around a 160% increase. And this is significant given you know, the, the, the state of Nigeria's electricity supply. Many households, many businesses have to you know, depend on alternative sources of power, which include um, diesel-fired um, generators. And like I mentioned, as the price of diesel increased, the cost of production for many manufacturers also increased, which fed into inflation 
prices. We also saw, you know, higher oil prices in the global economy, which, you know, also fed in. We saw, uh, um, uh, we, we are seeing, you know, currency pressures and, you know, demand management, uh, uh, demand management measures uh, by the Apex Bank, which is also, you know, uh, which is also passing through to headline inflation numbers. So um, you talked about diesel. We can trace that to the war in Ukraine. But uh, how much other factors or which other factors can we attribute to the war in Ukraine leading to this surge in inflation? I think first let's start with uh, neither Russia nor Ukraine is a, a, a major trading partner of Nigeria. So the effect we are seeing is mainly through commodities. One, we are seeing like, like uh, we are seeing uh, um, sharp rise in the, in the price in global oil prices, which are currently, I think, $114 uh, uh, dollars per yeah, barrel. Yeah, 113 this morning. Okay, $113 dollars per barrel. That increases the landing costs. You know, Nigeria, you know, is, although we're an exporter of crude, we import uh, refined petroleum products. So as the global commodity prices, the global price global oil prices rise, you know, the landing cost of PMS in the domestic economy also rise. But for PMS, because we still have, you know, we pay millions of millions of, of, of naira for subsidies. So we don't really see sharp changes in the price of, of, of PMS. But for diesel, because the, down, the downstream sector of diesel is fully deregulated, the, what we see is the market price of diesel as a result of, you know, what's happening in Ukraine. And that is what, why we saw, you know, a, short, a, a sharp increase from around, you know, 288 naira to the Per liter to around 700, 750, pa, I think, 750 naira per liter in March, because that's because of you know what's happening in Ukraine. Also, for some commodities like wheat, for example, Ukraine and Russia are some of the largest producers of wheat in the world, and uh, because of the you know the tensions between the, the, the war in, in in Ukraine, the price of wheat in the global commodity market has also increased. And because Nigeria is an importer of wheat, I mean, we import wheat for, for uh, um, spaghetti, noodles, flour, a lot of things. So there's also this, that imported inflation. And that's part of why we are seeing, you know, uh, the CPI increase uh, quite sharply. Yeah, and you know, you talked about the issue of subsidy. I mean, now it's now four trillion. At least that's the proposal, and it's gotten the approval of the lawmakers. So even though uh, Nigerians are not paying for it directly at the pump, we're paying for it because the money that would have been used for capital infrastructure, which will feed into the economy and uh, manufacturing and GDP, goes into subsidy, and we keep borrowing for that. But the, the last month, the month of March, which is the month in consideration. We also have that issue with substandard fuel, uh, which brought back long queues, you know, in filling station. Are we over that yet? Is the economy over that yet? Indeed, it seems, I would not say we are over it per se. I would say the situation has eased up a little bit. I mean, right now you could just drive into your petrol station and you don't have to queue for long or you will not even find any queues. And that's, I think, signals that, you know, the issue of substandard fuel has, has kind of kind of eased a little bit. So I wouldn't say it's over, but I'll say that it has, it has eased maybe significantly actually. And now we're having Libya closing its biggest oil fields. What happened and how do we expect this, you know, to affect price again? Because the price of oil it seems very, very sensitive. Yes, indeed it is. So for some context, Libya is what we call a fragile uh, a country. Um, they, they, they have a history of of civil war starting from I think the Arab Springs or uh, um, civil war in 2011 where you know NATO backed armed forces helped you know to oust their their their, their president Muammar Gaddafi so there, there's there's that history of that and what we are seeing now is some some continuation of the history so the of that history and a country like Libya is although it's oil rich it's, it's, it's very fragile and small threats to peace you know have Big implications, and what we are seeing now is some demonstrations, are uh, some protests and demonstrations, uh, because of uh, of the the, the 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 prime minister. There are some elections that I was supposed to hold in December that did not hold, and all of that is leading to some some demonstrations. So, so so what we are seeing is some armed forces, no, not armed forces, some armed groups going to some of the oil infrastructure to, to you know, suspend production to. Suspend production essentially. So all we saw is uh, we saw the the, the state-based uh, national oil corps suspend production and declare force majeure in uh, some of the in the largest you know oil 
uh, oil, oil field in Libya. And this is quite significant because Libya is one of the, is, is, a, is an OPEC, OPEC member and they produce around uh, 1.2 million barrels per day. So currently at least half 50% of their, of, their, of their production is offline. And that is, is quite significant also given the, the, the global, what is happening in the global commodities market, particularly in the oil market because of the, the Ukraine, the Ukraine, uh, 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 Russia um, crisis. There's already a tight uh, uh, supply situation. Now, I've been taking around 500,000, 600,000 barrels per day off that market. Is also, you know, is 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 deepening concerns about supply, and that is why we are seeing uh, oil prices increase quite um, sharply. Now, you know, we we have a lot of efforts going on. We have the U.S. Um, you know, from uh, uh, releasing from their reserve. Uh, we have talks with Iran uh, uh, also to bring them back into production. We have uh, the efforts to bring the UAE and even Saudi Arabia to release more. Uh, how, how are these going and how do we expect this to affect supply and consequently price? Let me start by saying I think Russia has threatened to, to you know, cut off supply from unfriendly countries. You know, and also the U.S. is trying to, uh, the U.S. and the West really are trying to, you know, to, um, to um, ban, to impose some sanctions. They've imposed some, but also trying to impose some more sanctions. For instance, the EU has imposed sanctions on, on Russia's coal exports. They're also trying to impose, you know, some more sanctions. But everyone is trying to be careful because Russia is such a huge, is a, such a huge um, oil producer. And if Russia does not, if, if Russia, you know, starts to reduce some of its exports, then the price of oil is going to increase quite sharply. But all these other talks, for instance, the talk with Iran trying to lift up the sanctions, the talk with the UAE, the talk with the US, all of that, uh, they're, having, uh, they're having some effect. But I think that is not big enough to, to make to significantly dent um, oil prices because because of the position that Russia has, I think that's, that's, that tension will continue to drive oil prices for the near to the medium term. And uh, also looking at the consequences of the war, uh, you, you, you alluded to this before, the issue of uh, wheat you know, and grains. Recently, the president in Nigeria approved the release of 40,000 metric tons of grains you know, to help buffer some of this. Because even before the war, I don't know if you remember, we had the issue with supply of, of corn, which uh, affects uh, millers, uh, goes down to your egg, goes to your bread, you know, and heats all, all of that. Um, is this enough, this 40,000, or do you think there's more that could be done in the face of all that's happening? It, it's, it's a step in, a, in the right direction, but it is not enough. Nigeria is a huge country. We have a huge population. We have huge youth or growing population. And as a result of that, there's huge demand coming from all of that. Also, we have a um, high urbanization rate around more than 50% of Nigerians live in urban cities. So all of that, you know, affects the demand for, you know, corn, for wheat. And that is why, you know, Nigeria is such, such, such um, a, a, a big importer of some of these products because the domestic production, even the, the, the reserves, is not enough to meet Nigeria's huge uh, uh, demand needs for these commodities. And now World Bank, uh, no, not just World Bank, we've had IMF, we have Fitch cutting growth outlook for the year 2022. Uh, what's the implication of this? What should we be doing now as Nigeria or as the world? What should we be doing with all this reduction in the growth outlook of in countries, of regions we have for sub-Saharan Africa, we've had for the world, we've had for Nigeria? What should we be doing now? I think we are, we, are, we are living in interesting times in it. I mean, we are living in, we are experiencing um, uh, once in a century events happening uh, uh, concurrently. One was the pandemic, uh, is the pandemic, pandemic. And because we are not even over, over the pandemic yet. Exactly. So one is the pandemic, two is, is, is this Ukraine-Russia crisis, which we've not seen the scale of this is the, the Second World War, which ended 1945. So we are seeing all of this, and the reason we, the, the reason, I mean, all of this, you know, plays also into 
into into global growth. The like you said, the World Bank cuts forecasts at to I think three point two percent from four point one in January. Around last year, their forecast for twenty twenty two was five point seven percent because everyone believed that oh twenty twenty two is going to be the year of recovery. You know the pandemic is easing. You know we've got the vaccines and everything is going good. And then comes the war. So first of all, that brings you know the issue of forecast into question. But the 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 key, uh, 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 there, there are key downside risks, and one of them, major one, is coming from from the um, Europe and Central Asia region because of this Ukraine-Russia crisis. We also have a, a China's a, a growth slow down a little bit, which is also putting some downside risks, some uh, amounting some downside risk to the uh, 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 to the growth forecast. Also, if the war persists, we are having issues like supply chain challenges. Possibly, uh, possibly financial contagion and debt crisis in the emerging market economy. Take all of this in the context of you know rising global inflation, right? And and, and central banks in in major global economies shifting stance towards you know uh, towards um shifting stance towards what's the word now uh, 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 hawkish moving towards um a hawkish stance. You know, so all of this is 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 a very interesting cocktail and. For emerging market economies, I think the the, the, the impacts are quite are quite significant. One, if if you know the, the, the hike in in interest rates globally moves faster than we expect, we we'll see capital flights which will mount pressure on all the, our external reserves, which is already pressured, and on our exchange rates. Also, our debt issues around debt. It's a lot of <laughs> it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a dangerous combination. Let's put it that way. <laughs> a dangerous combination. <laughs> and so that's a nice way to put it. But anyway, just before we let you go, what else is going on in the uh, commodity space? Uh, any good news there? You want to okay for domestic commodities markets, the prices are rising mainly due to uh, 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 um, logistic challenges. I mean, transporting some of these commodities from northern parts of Nigeria down, down to the south uses some of these uh, tractors and trailers that are fired by diesel. And given the spike in diesel prices, that is also you know, feeding down to domestic commodities prices. For instance, like we already alluded to, the price of flour in the domestic commodities market is up 5% to 22,600 month on month. The price of uh, beans also is up 5% to 40,000 naira month on month. Price of cement is up 7.5%. Uh, the price of tomatoes is up 20% to 12,000 naira. Price of pepper is also up 40% to 14,000 naira. Also, semo, price of semo, yam, sugar, all of them are also up, mainly driven by uh, 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 logistic costs. Logistic costs. Also, given that this year is a pre-election year, we expect that government spending, electioneering, campaign spending is also likely to keep some of these prices are um, elevated in the middle, in the middle to in the near to medium term. All right, uh, just a last morning. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, we hope those electioneering money will go into at least, like the printing industry. You know, it, at least it will still create employment and jobs for some uh, for a group of the population. Thank you so much for joining yes, us. Yeah. Adesola Lassumoni is an analyst with Financial Derivative, joined us from Reading in uh, the UK. Do enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, and you too. After the break, we'll talk about efforts towards food security, talking about commodities and uh, making it comfortable for Nigerians at least to feed. Well, join us for that conversation after the, after the break. This is Business Morning on channels television. Well, food prices continue to gain steady increase and the escalating security situation seems not to be helping matters at all. Besides insecurity, lack of access to finance and insufficient farm impute are some of the reasons for these soaring prices. Well, our next report takes a look at how farmers are calling for adoption of modern technology to boost food production which could end the in surge in prices and enhance food security in the country. This is a typical day in the life of a Nigerian farmer. From the north to some other states across the country, 
from lack of finance to inadequate supplies of farm inputs, such as fertilizer, herbicides, and lack of infrastructure, the challenges remain the same. And with the recent upsurge in insecurity, the prices of food continue to inch upwards. A total of 291 billion naira is appropriated for the agriculture sector out of the 16.9 trillion naira 2022 budget. Despite Nigeria's commitment to the 2003 Maputo and 2014 Malabo declarations to allocate at least 10% of the national annual budget to agriculture, the budgetary allocation is yet to reach 2% of the total budget. In collaboration with the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, Central Bank, farmers will be able to access loans and also seeds through the National Seed Council, improved seeds. Because when you have, once you have improved seeds, you will be assured of getting the enhanced production. Your yield will be very, um, very high and definitely you will have value for what you are doing. The federal government only recently announced that it has commenced the implementation of the National Fertilizer Quality Control Act 2019. It notes that with its over 70 blending plants operating, Nigeria is on its way to becoming Africa's fertilizer powerhouse. Some farmers, however, express worries over the bottlenecks associated with assessing loans to boost their productivity. This is just as the access to herbicides and pesticides is becoming difficult because of the increase in the prices of farm inputs. But some others are accepting innovative biotechnology. The future I've got of agriculture is good, it's wonderful. But, but because of this government thing that they couldn't come out to help, that is the reason, one of the reasons. And number two, farmers could not go to the banks to, to, for loans. When you go to the banks, they will say there's no money for agriculture. And so, so it is bleak. But if government allowed to help us, he will find us a little money so that we find uh, uh, seed, yeah, seed teams, seed uh, crops, then we manage and look forward. The National Biotechnology Development Agency is at the forefront of advocating for the acceptance of the technology because of its inherent benefits. Well, following up on that conversation, we have another farmer here in the studio. We have uh, the managing director of Banjoko Motunde Farms, Mr. Tunde Banjoko, joining us uh, to... Uh, thank God you heard that report. Good morning. Thank Good you for morning, coming thank on the show. Thank me. God you heard that report. Uh, yeah. Some farmers there, uh, the issue of technology, access to fund, um, still uh, being a major, a major issue you in you know your work yeah. uh, as a farmer maybe you should tell us from your own perspective maybe that's theirs tell us no, yours no, no. The, the, the report is spot on starting with the input of a thing in the last one year two years the price has been going up but this year i can confirm it's been 100 percent for inputs and that's making your cost of production. Would that be because of importation is that the fx importation uh, that's the part of the fx I mean, issue we're having in this sector. So if we're importing largely what some of the chemicals we are using to produce, and you can hardly also produce enough without using some of this input. Even the same thing with fertilizer, it's gone up really in the market. What we're buying, nine went to 15. Now for this year, most of our project is 22,000 that we are buying fertilizer. You have Dangote now. That's if you get, at least that is what you get in the market you, you're going to buy. So when last did you, um, Dangote has been on now for over a month. But all the ones we are buying now is 22,000. So um, How much was it before now? Like I said, it went from 8, 9, 15, but now 22,000. At least for some of our own projects, that's what we are So for buying. the last one month now, you've still been buying it at about 22,000. 22, so, so we haven't, maybe the Dangote input the hasn't fed has into the really market. come into the market space. Perhaps it's too early to say, do you so think? Or, we should or is there a little. gap? Is there a gap? Because uh, that was, for me, that was part of the conversation I, 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 I've been having when we celebrate the Dangote facility, T. you know, and the potentials. We don't want to celebrate it in isolation. We want to actually f see it feed into the, into the chain. So maybe we are still waiting for it to come into the market fully. 
maybe that's what I, it's more like the Dangote cement. You know, they supply wholesale large quantity. They have to resell. Maybe for some of us buying 200 bucks, 300 bucks, that can't go directly to the factory. You have to go to the open market to get your input. So it's a major bottleneck for us as farmers and that's so for you as a farmer yeah. i mean i mean this is something that we're supposed to fail so that's yeah. why i'm really interested so, you go to the open market, market to buy your to fertilizer buy. and most farmers do that really okay. most so the open markets are supposed to get from factories like dangote, dangote or and is the there likes. a middleman no I, I think some of the middlemen are merchants because agri is a value chain really yes it's a value chain some are into the markets I mean, the trading of these agro products. So some of them can stake their funds, buy larger volume in trailers, in trucks, to supply other smaller traders, where some of us will have to buy from, maybe in medium scale kind of, because you can afford to buy a trailer, because you probably don't even need a trailer. And because of time constraint at times, you are not even sure if I pay on Monday to say I'm receiving a truck, will I get it when I need it? So you probably want to go to a market, pay to, I mean, a vendor, and get your product supplied. So if you're having that issue, and coupled with other input as well, that has gone up by the same rate, it's gonna be giving us some of this effect we are still having now. Even though, but I'm trusting that probably with time, we'll be able to get the logistics arm right. Because one of the things I think is affecting that is the guys moving it in large truck quantity with their truck will get diesel. Like I got, we got, I mean, some guys coming, bringing stuff for us from Kogi, to Edo State, and the price they are charging for each truck of what they are bringing for us is twice, charging 300,000 instead of 150, 200,000 that they would have charged even in January. So that's the effect of diesel. So that could have also played into this fertilizer thing because their cost of movement from the factory to their store now distributing. So it's all interwoven. So it's very, the report is spot on that the prices are high in the market if the government can step in the issue of diesel. Because even in terms of clearing, if I could also use that as an, it's a major part of our operation, clearing as of maybe December, January, we still clear some portion of land, you are still paying 250,000 per hectare. Is that, is that the mechanized clearing? Mechanized clearing, you are paying 250,000 per hectare to clear an hectare of a land with a bulldozer. And now you are paying 450,000, 500,000 as that. March, April, because the price of diesel went up, and they use diesel largely and oil for their operation. So the prices of stuffs are really high, and it's affecting the bottom line. So these are the realities. That, those are the realities in the market. Yeah, and another, you, another thing that came up from that report is the issue yeah. of bottlenecks in accessing funds yeah. and loans, and you know even some of the grants and the help that the government has proposed for yeah. farmers, the, the bottlenecks around it. Yeah, yeah, yes, because, you know, you read about some of this, I mean, the project, the offers on paper, and I've had some personal experience with that. CBN will say, this is the policy, this is that, and you get to a commercial bank where you are supposed to assess this, and they are telling you, you have to collateralize. I want to mention names of bank for, yeah, for credible don't. reasons, you know, but, and even one gave me an offer letter some years back, but told me because I had to go to the extent of sending a mail to the MD of that bank that this is not what CBN said. And why, so they set up a meeting, I went for the meeting, they gave me the offer letter for the loan, and then they said, well, still collateralize this loan. I said, no, I'm not collateralized because CBN, they said, no, if this loan goes bad, CBN is going to come for us and all that. I said, but CBN didn't say, they should be collateral. So if you ask yourself, how many farmers can collateralize what they are getting? That's one aspect. The other aspect is the documentation. How many learned farmers? Most of our, what we consume locally now is from small older farmers, about 70 to 80 percent of it. So the guys in the local areas that can't even spell anything, but they know what they do. They know what to do to produce their maize. They know what to do to produce their cassava. Even though in smaller quantities, you know, they can hardly fill these forms. So you now give them forms, fill this, fill but that. But we need that. to do documentation. So how do we you solve can, this? We can localize our processes. We can. Why not look for a simpler method? Maybe BVN, if we can use BVN, if we can reduce the document they are filling. But because some of these guys too are skeptical now, because some dubious organizations have used their data to get government grants and loans, and never gave it to them. them. So some of them are even skeptical. 
filling any forms or giving you their data or information. So we have to make the process really simple. Even for us that seems to be a bit educated, you don't want to go through that bottleneck because you are not even sure that after filling all this, doing all that, would this same fund still come to me at the right time? Because that's another thing I've also observed. You, this is planting season for most people. And you started filling the form maybe December, January. You might be sure that after 12 months at times, you have not even gotten the fund. So those are some of the constraints. It really, there, there are a lot of bottlenecks that the government can look into, the procedure. Can we use our community leaders? Can we use our community leaders to see how we can make it easy for them? Those are some of the issues. And uh, yeah. a lot of applauds have been going to the Anchor Borrowers Bora. Program. I'd like to get your own personal the, perspective okay. on that. Okay. To be sincere, I think the government has spent about a trillion in the last four or five years on the Anchor Borrowers Program. It has yielded some positive results in some places. And about five million farmers have been engaged. And, but... Uh, there are bottlenecks or there are areas they can still work on to get better value. One trillion into agriculture and we are still buying food at the rate we are buying, we should be asking ourselves, what did we plant with the one trillion? Where was it planted? So those are the issues. So if you can answer that question, and now in some state that we even thought it was very successful, government is saying people are defaulting in the payment of those loans. Some of them had issues of insecurity in those areas. So. The program is good, but I think it should be reviewed. And for us to get more people coming on board of that program, it should be reviewed because the way it's presently structured, you can't have people who are really interested coming on board. It is almost becoming like a political game where people just think, okay, I'll get this money, I'll do whatever I like with it. We might not be able to get the real effect because I did a review for them in Ogun State some months back in Nabekota and say, if what we are saying is you do this program for cassava, at the end of the year, as a young guy, you are getting 150,000. At the end of 12 months, how many people will be motivated to do such program? If you, if you say it should be reviewed, what kind of review do you think? It okay, so one, the, there's a limit on the number of hectares an individual can do. So the, that can be reviewed. So say, like I give an example, 150,000. How many young guys wants to wait for 12 months to get 150,000? So that can be reviewed. So okay, we can increase the hectare. Then the procedure for getting the fund, you have to have an anchor to be able to say, and most of this anchor get this fund and even divert to other things. So you can allow some practitioner decide their own anchor without necessarily insisting the anchor must be the one giving you the fund. I can decide I have a better relationship with Mr. A. Let me deal with Mr. A. Let me give his own details, my details. You can monitor me. I was on a project in Oyo State. We had to pull out at some point because of the monitoring the Anchor Bora team were putting in place. Cleaning had been done, this had been done, and we are waiting for this authorization. And we had to abandon the project. Over 2,000 hectares in Oyo State. I won't mention the name of the company. You know, to over 2,000 hectares abandoned that could have been used to plant and move to the market. So those are some of the things. The team working on it are not as passionate as we, we expect them to be. They are not. And they are, they, I think the, the idea of being to, this is something that it's a national thing. And the way I feel now as a person, the rate at which food prices are going up, it's more like the NSAS. This is end food hunger <laughs> that we should pay attention to before it gets out of hand because really the cost... That's uh, if it's not already out of it's, hand. It, because before it gets out of hand. You know, I posted something on Twitter yesterday about the price of food that mm. we're spending close to 65% on food in a month. An average family, and the, somebody replied, said, Tunde, are you sure that's even for somebody who has an income? That is spends is 5%. <laughs> All right, uh, Mr. Tunde Banjoko, Managing Director of Banjoko Motunde Farms. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. You. Uh, that assessment on some of the government policies, thank I guess, you. is something we'll have to keep Look keep at, at uh, uh, over much. time. Thank you so much for being a part thank of the show. Thank you very much, Ine. We head to London now on the Great British Rail Sale. <clears throat> it's to slash prices by as much as half.
with cheaper off-peak travel on offer in April and May. But uh, transport campaigners are still talking about this. Well, thank God we have Juliana in London. Uh, she's closer to the action and she'll give us details. Hello, Juliana. Good morning. So what are these campaigners saying? Good morning, Innie. Well, the campaigners are saying it doesn't go far enough. However, I think it's important uh, to point out that they've welcomed this great British rail sale, which, as you just outlined, is one million tickets uh, going to be reduced uh, for some uh, by 50 percent. So typically it costs you about 44 pounds for um, uh, lower class seats, shall we say, to go from London to Edinburgh. From today, it will be about £22 if you are travelling off-peak, so not in the rush hour uh, times of about 8 to about 10 um, and any time uh, between 4 and 6 o'clock. And the reason why uh, the Department for Transport are doing this is because since the pandemic, um, there has been a significant amount of people that have stopped using uh, the railways. Uh, so between um, uh, October and December last year, there were about 280 5 million passengers, which does sound a lot, but that's 68% um, less than it was uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, campaigners have welcomed this, but they are asking uh, Grant Shapps, the Transport Secretary, to do uh, much more because just last month there was a 3.8% increase um, in rail tickets. This is the highest um, uh, uh, increase they've seen in about nine years. We know, of course, the cost of living, which has become a buzz term uh, for uh, UK families at the moment, is, is really hitting hard. And because of the pandemic has changed people's working patterns. Lots of people are working from home now. Um, uh, campaigners want the government to be more relaxed about peak times and off-peak times. But um, for the next uh, couple of weeks at least, uh, some passengers will be able to um, enjoy this uh, reduced uh, price. Yeah, well, it's a welcome relief. But the government is still getting knocks on its decision to send migrants to Rwanda. What, what are the issues here? Gosh, well, there, there, there are many issues, and I'm sure uh, these are all going to be thrashed out um, in court. The Prime Minister has taken a swipe at what he calls politically motivated uh, uh, lawyers who are challenging this um, in court. Um, we know that uh, uh, the House of Commons is sitting today. It's going to be a big, big day uh, for the Prime Minister, and we are expecting um, a, a severe amount of backlash uh, from opposition MP MPs, uh, the, the government is, is basically at the moment embroiled um, in a big battle that also involves uh, the Church of England because we know that the Archbishop of Canterbury on Sunday during his Easter service described uh, this uh, new uh, £120 million uh, plan as a sinful. Some people have called it legalised human trafficking. And just to remind our viewers, uh, Priti Patel, the Home Secretary, has travelled to Kigali. They have agreed with the Rwandan government that any uh, uh, migrants that cross the channel, so that big swathe of water between France and the UK, uh, will now be sent uh, to Rwanda for five years to restart uh, their lives. And now, again, as I said, there are several issues, but one big issue people are talking about is culture. Um, a lot of these uh, people that are coming from Iraq, Syria, um, Iran, are they going to want uh, to uh, start their lives um, in Africa when culturally um, it's just not something that they would choose to do? So there are several issues. These will be thrashed out. Uh, but the government at this point do seem to have the backing uh, from backbenchers, which is important if it's going to pass a vote in the Commons this week. Yeah, well, obviously, uh, an ongoing story there, Juliana. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you at 1.30 during Business Incorporated. Thank you. Well, the program would not be complete without a peep into the crypto market. Ladi? Yeah, yeah we're seeing uh, uh, the market now a little bounce uh, right there. We're seeing it's now at fear at 27 point. It was extreme fear yesterday, but we're getting uh, fear this morning. Market cap, $1.89 uh, trillion. That's up about 4.54%. And we're seeing Bitcoin there bounce from that 38,000 level uh, back to 40,771. Well, let's uh, bring in Rume Ofi now. Uh, hello, Rume. Good morning. Morning, Lazi. Good morning. Good, uh, good morning, Rumi. Well, we saw that bounce uh, for Bitcoin there from about 38,000, and now we're trading at 40,000. What's pushing sentiment in the market this morning? Lazi, I must tell you for a fact that uh, a lot of people are actually basing their sentiment on all oh, what is going on in the U.S., all oh, certain economic uh, uh, update that is going on. I can tell you, uh, 
categorically now that what is going on in cryptocurrency, that movement from 40, 40, 30, 39, 38, just respecting that range and people are buying. Mm -hmm. uh, we may not see it in dollar term now going up, but um, with all, all of these things that is going on, we're going to see the market pushing in a, long, in a short period of time. People are a bit scared, uh, but uh, it's uh, what institutions do to buy more at this point in time. So retail, re retail investors should be very careful not to sell all their cryptos because they think it's going to go to zero. You know, it is just respecting, uh, I call it an accumulation mm -hmm. uh, point, where you see now 40, 39, 38. So in a short period of time, we're going to be seeing bounce uh, in the market. I'm very optimistic that this will happen uh, in a short period of time. We've seen that in, from uh, 28th of March to now, it has done about 20% downwards, which means that more people are going. But you should also look at the situation where the market is doing higher lows and higher highs. It's a signal that people are buying, but it's not showing in the dollar value. Thank you. Right. And we're seeing uh, the, the NASDAQ if you have futures. I checked it you know, a couple of minutes ago, and that's uh, in the red at the moment. But we're seeing Bitcoin, you know, have that bounce, but we know there's a correlation between the two. But we'll see how uh, this bounce continues uh, through the rest of the day. Thank you so much, Rume. Exactly. Thank you very much, Ladi. It's my pleasure. All right. So uh, Ethereum, they're back above uh, $3,000, uh, just as shy of that $3,000 mark at 24-hour volume, 17.14. Uh, billion dollars. We look at the top also. My market cap is all green there. BNB there, four hundred and sixteen dollars. That's up four percent. And we see eCash there uh, up about five point six two percent. And XRP seventy seven cents. That's up four point uh, seven zero uh, percent. So we need. That's how the market is looking today. Yeah, we hope it's sustained, and then we'll see how a Friday would go this week. Looks thank a little so shaky much. to me, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right, laddie, thank you so much. Uh, don't express up to pessimism, don't worry. Let's be optimistic. It's, right. It's, it's, it's going to go that way. <laughs> well, that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for being a part of it. We have uh, three more episodes for this week, and we'll have great times and great conversations here on Business Morning. See you tomorrow. I'm Amini John McQuarrie.